Welcome to our next on Nautilus 2021 virtual event series. My name is Madison, and through the next few months, these events will be opportunities to hear about the excitement of our expeditions, preview the stories coming to you from sea, meet and engage with inspiring teams from OET's core of exploration, and learn about the science, technology, engineering, and history that excite them. We're so glad to have you joining us via Facebook and YouTube. And just a reminder, you'll be able to ask questions of our explorers by adding comments and questions below. But first, let us know where in the world you're watching from. We love hearing from you and knowing that we have viewers joining us from all over the planet. Now, our third expedition of the Nautilus 2021 season has just begun, and the ship is now in the northeastern Pacific Ocean off the coastline of British Columbia in Canada. For the next month, we'll be underway supporting the work of engineers, researchers, and data scientists from Ocean Networks Canada. And we are now three dives into the expedition the next will be happening later this week at Endeavor Ventfield. Don't miss that one. It's always an exciting expedition. And today we brought together four members of the upcoming expedition team to share their perspectives about the mission, answer your questions, and give you a preview of what exploration activities you can be a part of with the team on NautilusLive.org. But first, let's get started learning a little bit more about Ocean Networks Canada with Kate, President and CEO, Kate, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about the incredible work that Ocean Networks Canada does. Oh, great. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. <clears throat> I'm uh, Kate Moran. I'm president of Ocean Networks Canada, and I'm proud to lead an incredible team of innovators, engineers, technologists, and scientists, because Ocean Networks Canada is, is an operator of infrastructure. But before I jump into the actual uh, infrastructure that we operate, I first want to acknowledge and respect the Lo Quanguin peoples, on whose traditional territory some of us meet today, and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wusanich peoples whose historical relationship with the land continues to this day. So we are, we, our headquarters are on these lands. And so Ocean Networks Canada operates digital and physical infrastructure, uh, mainly through telecommunication cables. And you saw that image on the beginning. So we connect basically sensors to the internet via telecommunication cables and power. And we have over 8,000 sensors streaming live data to anyone in the world who wants to use it for research purposes, understanding the ocean, for, for just students to learn about the ocean, and also for coastal communities in our coastal observatories to make decisions about their own ocean front yard. A phenomenal piece of, of information. I mean, 8,000 sensors, that's absolutely incredible. What do these deep sea observatories help us better understand about our ocean and planet? Well, Ocean Networks Canada measures almost everything that can be measured in the ocean from <laughs> whales to microbes to chemistry, physics, and even we have a neutrino observatory. But two of our, our big themes in terms of what we what our sensors monitor for are natural hazards, particularly those related to earthquakes and the generation of tsunamis, so that we can actually pro provide alerts to the Pacific Tsunami Center and also to the coastal communities of British Columbia for the tsunami alerting. The other big thing we have is trying to understand how the ocean is changing during climate change. We know that a third of the CO2 that we've emitted during our, our burning of fossil fuels has been absorbed by the ocean, causing, for example, ocean acidification. There also is heat that's been absorbed, so the ocean is warming. So we need to understand these so that we can protect the ecosystem of all of the, all of the whole food web, from the smallest uh, critter to the fish that you see in these images. And of course, the salmon are critically important to the indigenous peoples of, of British Columbia and other fish species to other parts of Canada. Right, and that's such a crucial reminder that the deep sea is still so connected with the rest of our, our planet, right? I mean, it's it's phenomenal. And mm -hmm. we're entering you know, more than half a decade of OET and ONC working together. How does working with EV Nautilus fit into the big picture of ONC projects? Well, first I just wanna acknowledge that I love working with Bob 
<laughs> he's just a, he's just a delight, and I know he's the he's the brain behind all, behind all of the of the work that gets done by Ocean Exploration Trust, and now he has others that are, are working with him to continue that on into the future. So uh, it's just a delight to be working with with Ocean Exploration Trust. But one of the keen things about us is that we love being able to utilize the remotely operated vehicles, mainly Hercules, because it was designed to do very precise things. And we have very sensitive instruments that need to be swapped out. We need to make underwater connectors that need that fine skill of, of the Hercules ROV and the pilots that operate it. And, and also having that pilot's understanding how to operate both of those, those ROVs in tandem as the ship is 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 working it's 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 magic on keeping it uh, on location and untangled from the umbilicals and of course this incredible new um command center is just tremendous for us because we not only have loggers on board with you we also have loggers uh, uh, on shore uh here in our building and our headquarters uh on uh, on first nations territory right and just like onc has that telepresence uh technology hercules also helps sort of present what we're seeing in the deep ocean to viewers around the world what are some of the highlights of the current expedition and, and what are you looking forward to about it well first we just want to celebrate like you said that this is our sixth year working together and i can't tell you how there's so much synergy between our groups in terms of your work in exploration we are doing operating and maintenance but Every time that we go out with you, we have new discoveries as well. And it's just the, I think it's the way uh, that your teams work so well with ours that just makes this just always a magical expedition. We're also gonna be laying set, what we call secondary cables and we have developed uh, with Nautilus and with the big cable innovator, the, the ability to actually use a two ship operation to <clears throat> install uh, cables very precisely from point to point. These are telecommunication cables, typically very challenging for a single ship to do. And so we've, we've uh, developed this uh, ship and ROV dance with you, and, and we're gonna continue to, to install our secondary uh, uh, cable in, uh, infrastructure. We're also um, going to be installing one, one of the world's first. There's, there's others, there's, we're, we're one of a few in the world, installing what's called marine geodesy. And that is that we're putting basically monuments on the seafloor using uh, Sonardyne's fetch systems that basically uh, link to the seafloor and move with the seafloor so we can measure plate motion. <clears throat> now, the reason this is marine geodesy is because global positioning system doesn't penetrate the water column. So to, for these fetch sensors to talk to the global positioning system in the satellites, we have a surface wave glider that is the bridge that connects these sensors to essentially the satellite system. So it's this combination of autonomous vehicles and monuments and uh, innovative technology that will allow us to begin to actually measure the motion of the plates at that, that, down, that, that, that helps us better understand what you saw in that first image of the, the generation of earthquakes. So that's, that's a very exciting advancement for us. In addition, we're going to <clears throat> put Wally back in the water. Wally's our crawler that's developed by Jacobs University in Germany. And this is many years that we've been using Wally. And it's nice to see us having our putting Wally back in the water just as we're seeing an explosion of interest in, in rovers on Mars. So let's get people looking at our, our rover on the seafloor and, and become part of the party of, of rovers uh, in exploration. Kate, and I cannot. Oh, go for it. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, no, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I cannot wait for the return of Wally. We have a couple of viewer questions. They want to know what the name of the second ship was again. Would you mind repeating that? Yes, it's called the Cable Innovator. And it's, a, it's how EV Nautilus, this is called CS Innovator for cable ship. And it is the largest uh, cable ship in the world. And it, it's actually home ported in this region. So we're able to access it quite, quite readily. It had to go off to uh, Alaska recently to repair a cable because of the big 8.2 magnitude earthquake off of Alaska in the last few weeks, but it'll be back during the time we're working with you on, on the Nautilus. Awesome, just in time. <laughs> yes. well, yeah, Kate, thank you so much for telling us about ONC today. Um, you know, we 
are so excited to be working with you as well. And like you said, the synergy is just, it's indicative of six expedition seasons together. We've talked a lot about the ship, so I think it might be a good idea to learn more about the expedition with the team currently on board Nautilus off the coast of British Columbia. Perfect. We're going to, yeah, thank Thanks you so, so much. much. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna head on over to Ian. Um, Ian is currently on the deck of Nautilus. Coming in there. <laughs> Ian, do you want to? I'm here. Yeah, all right, cool. Oh, this is so exciting. So Ian. Hi, Maddie. Hey, good to hear your voice. Would you mind introducing yourself to our viewers and, and telling us a little bit about your role on this expedition? Well, welcome to the aft deck of the Nautilus. Uh, my name's Ian Coolen. I'm the director of observatory physical operations. So we have a digital side, which is where all the data goes. And the physical side is dealing with all these instruments. Uh, back deck of Nautilus normally would have Argus, which is under the black tarp behind me, and Hercules, which is presently in its hangar on the side. Um, and the deck would be normally fairly clear, but at ONC, we love to take instruments offshore and deploy them and recover other ones. We've got over 100 devices that we're going to be swapping on this cruise over the next 28 weeks. Uh, to do that, we've got a winch that we've acquired leasing from our borrowing from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Um, other great instruments we've got right up in front here, we have three different bins, which are moorings, which will be going out the Endeavor hydrothermal field. Uh, these moorings end up, they'll be uh, 300 meters in the water column uh, with instruments located at uh, set distances of four different sets uh, throughout that 300 meters. Uh, behind me here on my hard hat, we've got a, a short period seismometer. Uh, I'm standing on, Kate mentioned the geodesy experiment. This is a, one of the little over a ton of concrete. We've got uh, four of them left on the deck. We've already deployed uh, two of them. Uh, and the, the actual uh, device that will communicate with the surface equipment mounts on here. Those are called the fetches. Um, I've got my hand. This is one of our acoustic beacons. These go, they're on the ROV. They're on uh, both Hercules and Argus and on the winch, when we use the, wire, the line from the winch to deploy stuff off the end, we'll put one of these on there. This will give us the distance of how far down we are and the position of where we are on the seafloor, talking back up to the, to the ship. Um, looking behind me, we've got uh, what we call as our tool basket, uh, which uh, will again raise up and down on the bottom, being able to take heavier gear down. Right now in there is what an instrument called the RAS PPS, which is actually two different instruments that are going to be going down at the hydrothermal vents, where hopefully we'll be there in about four days. As you can see, the weather's not too great out here right now. Uh, lots of heavy seas. Uh, it's too rough for the, the vehicles to dive, and it was actually this morning too rough for us to even drop. What we have here is two out of three. The third one is over here, uh, sediment traps. They're like giant funnels that the particulate matter falls into them and there's a little carousel on the bottom that rotates on a program to collect sediment samples on the bottom throughout the year and we swap these out every year. Lots of different instruments back here. Um, we've got hydrophone that we're going to be deploying with the Dalhousie University and uh, there's uh, benthic uh, recorders that are looking, they're called bars, they're looking at, uh, at the vents as well. Um, so our, our, everybody's looking forward to the hydrothermal vents or the black smokers as they're called. Uh, water temperatures up to 400 degrees Celsius or you know, 400 degrees Fahrenheit at that temperature it really doesn't matter. Uh, a busy month out here and as Kate mentioned the cable ship, Cable Innovator will be meeting us uh, around, it looks like around the 20th of August now uh, for some fun filled dual ship operations, very tight close quarters. You'll, uh, if you log in during that time you'll see just off the stern behind me here, uh, less than 100 meters away, will be the world's largest cable ship. So it's rather uh, um, daunting to sit there and realize how close we are out at, at the sea. And it requires a special skill set from the captains on both and crews on both ships, as well as the ROV pilots. And uh, the ROV pilots, uh, all but one of them, are uh, have been with us before on multiple uh, previous expedition so it's, it's great we've got a good solid uh, team here then we're doing a great uh, great bit of work uh, hopefully the sun's great the winds will come down the waves will come down and uh, we'll be able to continue uh, actually after midnight tonight we'll start uh, deploying some gear that's on the back off the stern including uh, three of these fetches that as I'm standing on the, the base of one of them right now how's awesome. that 
that was such a good overview. And, you know, from my, from our perspective, yes, the sun is out, but it looks pretty rocky. And it's just a great reminder that as the ocean is dynamic, so do, so must be our expeditions and, and sort of our dive plans. So thanks for giving us that awesome um, overview. We have a viewer question. Some, one of our viewers want to know how deep the ROVs will dive this expedition. On this expedition, I think the deepest we'll be going is about 27, almost 2,800 meters. So just a little under three kilometers. Um, and that's the that's the deepest uh, for ONC for all of our gear. Um, the views themselves uh, can go deeper than that, up to 4,500 for Hercules. And 6,000, I believe now, is the limit of Argus. And that is controlled. Uh, they have the cable here. They, it's a, a 0.68 of an inch in diameter that five that cable is seven kilometers long uh it's a new cable uh we got a new deck here on on our uh, nept or sorry excuse me on the nautilus as well with an additional four meters off the back which gives us more space and a new crane behind us which uh is being operated by larry Mayer, a former board member of onc at the university of new hampshire they'll be operating this on the next cruise after us that's great. And again, we're looking at those rocking waves and we had another viewer question. They want to know, does the crew ever get seasick? Uh, yeah, all the time. Um, <laughs> it depends on the person. Uh, I, I get, you know, my first couple of days out, I get a little queasy at times, especially with weather like this. Uh, I find it hard to sit and stare at a computer screen, uh, reviewing dive plans and stuff like that. So I actually came out on deck and was working with our, our crew, the ONC team is out here prepping for uh, tomorrow's operations in in spite of that and other people never get seasick it, it's an individual thing um and you can compensate for it with different ways of my policy on it is just to suffer through the first and then you're fine And if you mask it with uh, medication then you end up being kind of drowsy for the whole trip so uh, uh I, I say no to the drugs and i'll just suffer through it for a little bit and then get past it <laughs> And then when you get back on shore, you get what's uh, called dock rock or uh, land sick. Um, you'll feel that motion even when you're on shore. And it's kind of a, a weird feeling later on. I imagine after a month out here, we're all going to have that when we get back into British Columbia, into Victoria. Absolutely. Yeah. It's kind of like you can't, you know, you can leave the ship, but it still comes with you even when you're back ashore. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, we're, we're looking at weather challenges and delays. What what's involved in making an expedition um, a success? And and what are some of the challenges and variables that you're contending with right now? Well, the biggest challenge today is the weather um, and the sea state. Um, you've got a lot of different equipment. Uh, some of it, no matter what, always ends up there's something this last minute that's going to change or it's going to be different from from what you had planned. Um, so it's the ability to be able to quickly adapt to, to those changes. Um, we've got gear that, like these moorings, we need comp seas for that. So right now we've got a plan in place that says when we're going to deploy those, but that's not going to happen. The weather never cooperates uh, with what we plan, so we'll be shifting things around. Um, you've got, uh, you know, it's a lot of work back on shore leading up to the expedition. We've been working on this since last year, so, uh, and beyond in some cases. Uh, you know, these, uh, Dr. Martin Heisman, who, these geodesy experiment, he's an ONC uh, senior scientist. Um, he's been working on this for a couple of years now, and um, this is the coming to fruition of getting all these down. Um, so it depends. Uh, you know, it's it's a long term process. There's a lot of thought involved, a lot of logistics and planning and getting things right. I mean, this winch had to come from Woods Hole. It's got to go back to Woods Hole, which is on the East Coast. And um, we had to buy line for it. There's just a, lots of things to think about all the way along. And no matter what, at the end of the day, you always forget something. But the luck has it that with Nautilus, there's a great crew on board and, and the OET staff on board are always there to help and they come up with solutions for us. It's a team effort all around. It absolutely is. And Ian, thank you so much for your phenomenal tour of the aft deck. It is just, it's, it blows my mind away the amount of technology and work that goes into an expedition. Um, so thank you for sharing that. And, and I'm so excited to see where you guys dive next. Uh, Moving on, we've talked a lot about our control van and the team, you know, in within it. We're going to move now um, to Adrian. 
She is on ship in the studio, our brand new studio that we're so excited to share for you. Adrian, would you mind introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about your role on this expedition? Yeah, for sure. So my name is Adrian Schumlich, and on the ship, I am a GIS specialist and a data logger. Um, so GIS, that involves um, sometimes creating maps. So for example, this morning, I was sitting down with one of our scientists adding some uh, hydrothermal vents from a paper to a map so that we can better understand where they're located on the seafloor. Um, I also am there if Ian is wondering how long is it gonna take for us to get from here to here based on ship movement and direction. Um, so this actually on the screen right now is an example of one of the maps that I created um, to prepare for the expedition. So I don't know if you can see it, very well with the scale, but um, basically what it shows is uh, the cables um, and instruments at Endeavour, um, as well as the labels on the cables and the IDs and names of each instrument. So that really helps us when we're diving so we can see, okay, this instrument is located here and it's connected to this specific device, which is connected to this other junction box perhaps. Um, so that really helps us when we're logging dives so we can say, okay, here's the ID, it's connected with this cable to this. So um, that helps us understand what, what's really going on. Um, we also, those fetches that Ian was previously talking about, I got to work on that um, project and, and help work with the scientists and with the engineers to decide where these cabled fetches are going to go. Um, so there's often several different parameters to consider. So we want to look at the slope of the seafloor. So we don't want to deploy them in an area that's maybe too sloped. Um, we also want to try to avoid um, having the cables go over top of each other, just makes our cable management a little bit easier. Um, so there's often quite a few things to consider. So I'm really excited to be involved in a team that helps decide where these incredible instruments go on the seafloor. Absolutely. And it's very important work. It's at the crux of everything that we do. And, you know, our viewers hear a lot about logging the dives. And, and when we're talking about logging dives, what exactly does that involve? And, and what does that even mean? Yeah, so basically logging dives is kind of like telling a story about what's happening in the dive. So that way a user can log in, they can look at the video and they can get a story of exactly what's happening. They can say, okay, here we are and we've already descended and we've plugged in this instrument to this specific port um, with this cable. So that also helps. Um, so there's an example on the screen there. That's kind of what the new dive, we're really excited. We have a new dive logging um, it's called C-Tube V3, so we're really excited about it. Um, that's an example of a button set on the left there. So I'll click buttons and I'll say, hey, this, um, this instrument was deployed. I'll get a position, some coordinates. Um, I'll also get heading. That's really important for some specific instruments. They need to know exactly the direction that they're facing. Um, I'll also get the depth um, and that helps the scientists be able to use the instruments. So they need to know those specific parameters in order to be able to use the data that comes out of it. So incredible. And you guys are in the control van. You, you know, when we're diving, when we're operating, you're listening um, to everybody on the mics and fielding questions from viewers around the world. Someone wants to know, um, how long it takes questions to come into the website. And it's pretty real time. Um, we often have a, a member of the communications team behind screen asking those questions of the science team. I'm sure you guys get them all the time. Um, and you know, just as we do in the control van, we're seeing your questions in real time uh, right here, right now. So if you do have any questions for our team, please feel free to send them in. We love hearing from you all. Um, so, you know, Get them in there, <laughs> and you, when we're when we're logging things, you know, we're really paying attention to everything out there, including different species. Do either of you know um, how often the ships discover new species? It's a little bit of a trick question. That's a great question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I first of all want to say about the questions. We we love hearing the questions, and mm -hmm. oftentimes it helps us get a little bit of clarity too. Uh, so this is actually my first time on the Nautilus. Um, and so oftentimes I have questions about the same things maybe the viewer has a question about. So they want to know maybe what a specific instrument does. And we have the scientists right there and they can kind of contextualize 
things for us. And, and oftentimes I'm learning um, along with the users. So yeah, definitely keep the questions coming. We love it. Um, and that's a great question. <laughs> Last year when I was logging, I, this isn't biology related, but we found a chair. We found a chair at 2,500 meters, I believe. So that was kind of interesting. It was standing upright and it looked like it was ready to be sat on. So you, you never know what you're gonna find at the deep sea, but Maranke might be able to give a little bit more information regarding the biology. Um, yeah, I just log uh, biological <laughs> species. I've yeah. never, I've never, well, this is also my first time on the Nautilus, so I've never seen anything new, any new discoveries, but there are a lot of sea cucumbers. <laughs> it does happen, um, yeah. <laughs> a lot of shrimp. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we um, so far haven't um, dove quite yet at Endeavor. That's often where we find some really exciting, exciting things. So. More to come, I'm sure. <laughs> There's yeah. always Many more to come. come. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Adrian, that was such a good introduction to Maranki. She is um, currently aboard as an ocean science intern in Nautilus's science and engineering internship program. Uh, Maranki, would you mind introducing yourself and giving us a better idea of what your role is on this expedition? Yeah, sure. So, hi, I'm Maranki Harris. Um, I'm an ocean science intern with OET here and also help Adrian out with the data logging. Um, oh, outside, great job. Yep, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> outside of the ship, I'm a graduate student in oceanography with Dr. Kim Juniper at the University of Victoria on Vancouver Island in Canada. Um, and my thesis is all about deep sea mining and evaluating environmental impacts of deep sea mining. So the effect that it may have on microbial genetic diversity and novelty. That is so relevant too, especially as we're looking towards the deep ocean for you know a better understanding of the processes on our planet. Uh, we have another question from a viewer who wants to know, does weather and storms change the topography of the seafloor? We know that perhaps mining can, but do you have an idea of if weather or storms uh, you know, alter what we're looking at on the seafloor? Um, well, Perhaps, I'm not too sure about that. I would, I know that it definitely alters the top of the ocean. So if it were to alter the currents, maybe that would also affect the seafloor itself. Um, it depends on the depth of the seafloor uh, because in more shallow areas, of course, if it affects the physical oceanography of the water within the ocean, then it's going to affect the ocean seafloor. But at sort of about let's say, for example, 3,000 meters. I don't know how much the weather at the ocean surface would affect the seafloor itself. Absolutely. Well, let's hear a little bit more about your research and you know what you're specifically looking at during this expedition. Yeah, so uh, basically as a data logger, as Adrian explained, I um, log things that we see on uh, during our dives with Hercules and Argus. So I log everything from when the dive would start to biological species that we're seeing and geological formations that we'll see when we go to the Endeavor Ridge and see the hydrothermal vents. Um, and also in the wet lab, I help with sample processing. So samples that are taken from our ROVs, like for example, so far I've been helping Ocean Networks Canada staff scientists with processing sediment cores uh, from around 2000 meter depth and I've been helping them process those for eDNA and microplastics analysis. And then later on, what I have coming up is a little bit of something to do with my research and my thesis. So we're going to perform a photogrammetric survey of Dudley, not Dudley, sorry, Dante and Grotto on the main Endeavor vent field. And what I mean by that is we're going to be going down with ROV Hercules and taking videos of those hydrothermal edifices and then turning those videos into 3D models using software from Infomare in France. So we have pre-processing software that'll take that video first and turn it into thousands of photos. And then we have 3D modeling software that will turn those thousands of photos into um, a 3D model. And that's the first step in this bioprospecting methodology that I'm creating for evaluating deep sea mining environmental impact. That's phenomenal. So it'll really provide a bigger picture of what we're looking at in these in deep sea environments. Yes, yeah, definitely. That's the goal because so little is known. 
Right. Yeah. It, it always amazes me how little we know about the seafloor. What excites you most about studying these extreme environments? And and again, you know, these places that we really know a little bit about, but we're just learning more and more every day. Well, for me, it's definitely all about the rarity. I love the uniqueness of the location and the uniqueness of the, the type of science that we do. Basically, what we're doing out here is um, we're seeing places that not many people get to see and we're going places that not many people get to go and we really help contributing to the exploration of what I call Earth's final frontier and what many others in the deep sea science world call Earth's final frontier. I love that, Earth's final frontier. I'm from Alaska and we call it the last frontier. So <laughs> that resonates for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that I'm so excited to see where your research go, co goes and what comes of it and, and learn more about these amazing environments and especially the work that's going on over the course of this upcoming expedition. Um, so thank you both for sharing that. And, and I'm just absolutely thrilled. We're going to open it up now to some questions from the audience as well. Um, I believe it looks like we have a question for Kate with ONC. Kate, are the new fetch instruments planned to last longer than the original ones? For example, will they transmit data um, far as many or more for more or fewer years or as the first round of instruments did? Yes, um, they're plan we're planned to have those instruments operating for uh, hopefully a decade or more so that we can begin to understand the plate motion. It's very difficult to, to monitor plate motion in the ocean, as I mentioned, because we don't have global positioning system through the water column. So that's the, that's the goal to actually really in the long term understand that plate motion. And it would be part of the longer term goal in seismology and, and earthquake scientists understand, you know, how and why large earthquakes occur. Can I, I wanted to go back to the question about weather. Is that okay? Oh, yes, please. Absolutely. Yeah, so, it, so there was research done at, at one of our locations at Berkeley Canyon, where Wally is, where the, there was, it, we learned that from the scientists who used the data, that storms actually change the actual release of gas hydrates from the seafloor. And so because those gas hydrates form like venting systems, they're called cold vents essentially, they do change the, the shape of the seafloor. So that was one example of weather changing the seafloor. We also know that, that weather will change the seafloor in coastal areas and we, we operate some radars on land that look out over the ocean um, to understand waves. And we have one that's, that's monitoring tsunami waves. And right after we installed it, there was a, what's called a meteo tsunami, a tsunami generated by weather that actually came in, hit the coast, and actually re restructured the, the coastline because of that dynamic. So there's, there's, there's quite a number of things we need to learn more about how the surface ocean impacts the deep ocean. Absolutely right. I mean, it's it goes back to the same concept that we're all connected in all of these various ways, whether you're onshore or at sea or in the deep ocean. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have kind of a fun question. And Kate, I'll, I'll start with you. Do you have a favorite deep sea fish? Well, my favorite is was an image that was taken before I even started Ocean Airways Canada is a, a deep sea skate. They are just magnificent creatures. And when they when they you see them in the deep ocean, they're like these beautifully swimming white ghosts. That was absolutely beautiful. <laughs> Adrian or Maronki, do you have a favorite deep sea fish? I like anything that is bioluminescent. Mm -hmm. I, I find them to be just incredible. It's kind of like a light show underwater. <laughs> so anything that, that is able to um, emit light, I think is, is quite cool. Yeah, and and we as as you know, we've been we we also installed from last year and the year before uh, a neutrino observatory to actually detect neutrinos. But it has the other purpose of measuring bioluminescence. So again, I, I agree, it's it's magical yeah. to see bioluminescence in the deep ocean. Yeah. And there's a there's a there's an artistic version of a skate behind me in the carving, <laughs> the white skate. Oh, cool. oh wow, <laughs> that's awesome. Um, yeah, and you know, bioluminescence is such a cool thing, and I want to come back to it. But first, Ronki, I have to know: Do you have a favorite deep sea fish? <laughs> um, I don't know about a favorite deep sea fish, but I do love the uh, firework jellyfish. Mm -hmm. it doesn't quite count as it's not a fish, but it's a deep sea animal. <laughs> <laughs> 
Absolutely. Yeah. I know Nautilus, um, I think it was 2018, has a, a phenomenal capture of um, a, a firework jelly that I highly encourage everyone to check out on nautiluslive.org. Um, and just so everyone knows, we're still feel, fielding questions from you all. So please feel free to come in and, and send those over YouTube and Facebook if you're watching. Um, you know, it's a, it's a great way to join the dive and to really participate in what we're doing here. I'm trying to like weed through all these questions. So thank you for bearing with me. <laughs> um, when we're looking at sort of these, these bigger expeditions, you know, what are some of the things that you all are most looking forward to when we're uh, spending so much time at sea and, and studying such a diverse array of, of biology and um, uh, hydrothermal vents and you know all of these different elements of science. Adrian, what are you most looking forward to about this expedition? Well, actually, so this is my first expedition with the Nautilus or expedition in general. And this has been something that I've wanted to do since the first day of my undergrad. So over 10 years ago, I've wanted to do an expedition at sea. So I'm just excited to take it all in. I've been uh, working from the office for, for the last year, year and a half, um, or from home. And um, I'm excited to just be there hands on and be able to actually see and, and you know, help put together um, some instruments before they get deployed at sea. So yesterday we were working with sediment traps and now I know, you know, I know exactly how a sediment trap looks. It's not just a, a photo or, or, you know, a, a dot on a map. It's, it's a real physical instrument that I get to see and, and work with. So I think that's what I'm most looking forward to, just taking it all in. <laughs> <laughs> Would you second that, Maronki, as well? Yeah, definitely second that, absolutely, because I'm also in the same boat as Adrian. This is my first expedition. It's something that I've always wanted to do, so everything about learning the ropes, and I love sitting in the control room and being able to see exactly what ROV Hercules is seeing at the time that it's seeing it. Speaking with my teammates on the intercoms is always amazing. And um, just the general atmosphere of the ship. Like, for example, we have five birthdays on the ship this week, and the chef is making a... <laughs> Adrienne's laughing because she knows where I'm going with this. <laughs> well, Marake always seems to talk about food, so that's why I'm laughing. <laughs> the chef is making a cake for each birthday, and that's a highlight for me because I love yeah. food. So if any of the listeners uh, right now also <laughs> tune in for our... Um, conversations when RV Hercules was diving, I am always the voice that peps up when <laughs> we're talking about food on the ship. <laughs> yeah, it, it could be the middle of the night, but if someone asks a question about food, Veronica's there to there to give her input, but on other things as well, but, but definitely food. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, food aboard Nautilus is such a central part of the day-to-day, -day, right? I mean, <laughs> so um, it's valid that it, it totally takes up a lot of space. I know when I was aboard, I was like thinking about seafood the whole time. Every time I saw a fish, I was like, oh my gosh, I could really use some sushi. <laughs> um, we have another viewer question. They wanna know what sort of background led you all to become data loggers um, and what other sorts of jobs are available that maybe don't require so much of an intensive education as you know being a lead scientist, for example. I think that's a that's a great question, and I took a really kind of windy path to to get here. I think um, in my undergrad, I I just basically realized that I loved ocean science for the same reason Maronke was saying. You know, it's the last, it's the final frontier, and it there's so much that we don't know. So I've always been drawn to things that that we don't know or things that could possibly we could possibly discover. So I signed up for every oceanography class that I possibly could. Um, and I did ended up uh, bugging my uh, the only oceanography professor at University of Calgary, uh, which is landlocked, um, mm -hmm. to do an undergraduate thesis with him. Um, and then actually ended up loving research so much um, that I went on to do a master's, but I instead worked at the top of mountains. So I worked at in the high Andes at 3,000 meters above sea level. And so, yeah, that's a photo from, from uh, some field work that I did in the Andes. And I ultimately decided that I, I love deep sea research. So it's been fun going from 3,000 meters above sea level to almost 3,000 meters below sea level. So I guess my tip would be if anyone wants to maybe do something like this is, is just know that people are willing to help. And, and if you ask, 
if you ask someone who you're inspired by, hey, how did you get where you where you are? Oftentimes people are willing to sit down with you because, you know, they had they had, they had people sit down with them and explain things to them and, and help them along their way. So oftentimes people are willing to do the same for, for other people as well. Absolutely. Kate, what sort of advice might you have to a middle school or high school student who's interested in a career in, in deep sea science? Well, I think it's important if you're interested in the science side to uh, make sure that you be serious about math. <laughs> That's always uh, important. But uh, almost even more important today is to to continue to improve how you write and, and be sure to, to read everything you can because the communication of what we do is sometimes even more important than the science itself. So those basics are very important, but there's a wide range of careers. So even on the Nautilus, you have people who are cooks on the Nautilus, people who are actually mariners who operate the ship, there's engineers who operate the ship, there's communication specialists, video specialists. So there's a wide range of skills needed to work in, in a world like the Nautilus. And at Ocean Networks Canada, we have data specialists, we have software engineers, we have uh, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, scientists, um, we have communication staff, and so a, a wide range of, of, uh, of different careers can be pursued, and then you could, you could steer them towards the ocean if, if that's your love. That's absolutely true. And to add to that, you know, we have artists at sea, we have internship programs. So, you know, depending on what anyone's interest is, you can apply it to deep sea research because just as the ocean is connected to, you know, earth processes, so is art and science and, and all of those many things. So it's, it's a great reminder that whatever path you're taking, um, it can lead you to the deep ocean. <laughs> yeah, that's why we, we've changed STEM to STEAM to make sure yeah, that we exactly. include art. Art is so important. Ocean Networks Canada has a, a res, art, artist in residence program too. So it just, it just opens up the, the way that we communicate the importance of the ocean to the broader public. It really does. Yeah, it's such a great reminder. And then when we're looking at sort of our, our careers as scientists um, and, you know, how we got to where we are, Maronke, what's one of the most surprising moments or discoveries of your career as a scientist so far? Uh, for me, it's really all been amazing and surprising. It's only been, I graduated from my bachelor's in 2017, so it's only been about three years that I've been in the ocean science field. Um, but the amount of traveling that I've been able to do and how welcoming and open the entire community has been. Like there's always been somebody who's been willing to look over an application or recommend me for something. Just the, the supportiveness of the scientific network is something that's been very surprising and nice for me. Isn't that the truth? Yeah, and, and that support is really just a huge element of, of working together as a scientific community, just like ONC and OET is working together once again. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us today. It's been so informative and I, I'm sure all of our viewers are just as excited as we are to see where Nautilus uh, takes us this round. Um, for those of you joining at home, remember that you can follow along and join this expedition on nautiluslive.org. Uh, for the next four weeks, as the ship visits hydrothermal vent fields, the continental shelf, the abyssal plain, and conducts daring dual ship operations, all streaming live for your participation. It just sounds, it is as epic as it sounds. <laughs> and if you're an educator, um, camp club, or community leader, and you want to get your learners connected with the ship, you can check out the live ship to shore interactions, which are free one-on-one -on -one conversations with the team aboard the ship directly to your classroom. So you can visit the education page at nautiluslive.org to sign up for a connection. It's you know a phenomenal way to get the science in your classroom. And then you can join us for our next live event to learn more about the next live expedition. That's gonna also be available on the nautiluslive.org website. But until then, we're so excited for what's coming up. And Kate, Adrian, Ronke, thank you so much for joining us. Ian, if you're listening, it was great to have a tour of the aft deck. Um, we'll see you all on nautiluslive.org. And thanks, 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 Maddie, for doing such a great job of joining us all together. That was yeah. wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, couldn't have done thanks it without so you. <laughs> yeah, thank you.